Let's pick up now in our discussion of this, um, uh, how the values of debt and equity will change as the value of the assets change. I call this the sun and moon of finance. I hope you'll agree that uh, this is a pretty uh, basic but insightful uh, way of looking at how value created through the assets of a company is reflected uh, in the values of the debt and equity. First of all, very simply put, assets represent anything of value owned by the business, resources owned by the business. From an accounting perspective, there's a much more involved definition, but for our purposes, I think this suits us well. Debt represents claims held by creditors, whereas equity represents claims held by the owners. In the case of a corporation, it would be the stockholders. Well, there are distinguishing features of each of these claims that are important to understand and understanding how value created in the assets is going to be shared, so to speak, between the creditors and the owners. First of all, let's note that debt is characterized by a finite term. That simply means that when you borrow money, you have to pay it back. And uh, so there is always some sort of a, a deadline. There is a due date, a maturity date associated with debt. We don't have that with equity. Uh, equity is characterized by having an infinite term. Uh, so if you buy shares of stock, for instance, in Amazon, you will never have a, a due date on that, date when the company, for instance, uh, is obligated uh, or is willing to retire that from you that's established uh, in the, uh, uh, let's say, on the, on the certificate itself or through the issue itself. Um, if you own shares of stock, say in Amazon, and you want to get out from under that investment, then you simply sell them. You find someone else who wants to buy them. But it does not have a due date. Uh, equity is issued essentially in perpetuity, that is, with an infinite life. Well, the next distinguishing feature is that debt is characterized by fixed return. We understand interest to be basically the rental charge on borrowed money. And so with debt, there is always a, um, an interest rate associated with it that establishes that return that's required each period. As a matter of fact, payment of interest is a legally binding obligation. And so if the company doesn't make uh, those, uh, the necessary payments, uh, then in fact it ends up uh, with the bankers telling them they had to run its business and nobody really wants that. Equity, on the other hand, there are no such uh, obligations. There's no promises about what you're going to get. As we'll see later on, it's one reason that equity is very tough to value compared to, to debt. You don't have promises uh, about what you're going to get. And so I characterize that as equity having a variable return. That is, it's subject to uh, uh, variation. It could be any n a number of values. Finally, debt is characterized, or I should say it represents a first claim on income and assets, whereas equity is characterized by a residual claim on income and assets. By income, we simply mean that each period there are certain claims that, uh, for instance, the interest payments, as well as the principal payments, that uh, creditors are due. And, and also, if push comes to shove, uh, if the company is in fact forced into bankruptcy, uh, then the creditors have a prior claim or a first claim on the assets of the company. Equity uh, has a residual claim on income and assets. It has a residual claim on income in that all expenses, if the company generates a dollar in revenues, all expenses must be deducted before you can have profit. And so it's only the profit that is what remains over, uh, remains after the, uh, all the expenses of operation are deducted from the revenues for a period uh, that really the uh, equity holders have a claim to. The profits of a business belong to the equity holders. But also, again, a residual claim on assets simply means that if, in fact, the company does go under or it's unable to pay its bills and goes into receivership, uh, then the creditors have a prior claim on uh, the assets of the company and those equity holders are left at the very end of the line. Now, these distinguishing features are pretty important. Let me slide back just a moment. Because what they all mean is that, and this is the way I like to put it, creditors here have a better idea of what they're going to get, when they're going to get it, and that they're going to get it than the equity holders do. This fixed return means that they have a promise, a legally binding promise of what they're going to get. 
from uh, from their credit creditor claim from their debt claim. The uh, fin the finite term means that there is a fixed schedule that has to be observed and has to be complied with. And of course, again, if uh, uh, finally, we should note here that ultimately the debt represents a primary claim on income and assets relative to equity. And so these guys having a better idea of what they're going to get, when they're going to get it, and that they're going to get it means that debt as a classification of security uh, represents a lower uh, risk uh, investment for, from an investor's perspective than the equity does. Uh, in broad terms, equity is riskier than debt. For a specific company, like Amazon, Amazon's equity is riskier than Amazon's debt. Now, that doesn't mean that the equity of company X is necessarily riskier than the debt of company Z. Uh, you could have a company that, well, like an uh, Amazon that's fairly risky, but you could have a company over here that's in receivership. You know, it's going through bankruptcy, and so its debt is uh, is very questionable compared to, say, Amazon's equity. But this will be something that will be important to us to understand later on uh, as we when we get into valuation of stocks and bonds and we talk about uh, the risk associated in more detail, the risk and the returns that have been, uh, let's say, earned or that are a characteristic of these classes of securities. Well, I talk about this as the sun and moon of wealth creation. Um, here's one more example. We talked about uh, with the example with my buddy Keith Riley about how the value, as the value of that car changed, how the value of the equity changed and the debt didn't. And now we have a better idea maybe of why it is, but let's try to reinforce the, uh, that again. How does the balance sheet change if the firm invests $6 cash to purchase equipment worth $10? Well, here we have a very simple balance sheet. We have cash of $10, other assets of $90. This would include, you know, could include receivables, inventories, fixed assets, and so on. But it's fine just to simplify that and, and just say this is other assets of $90. Uh, let's just say debt is $60, equity is $40, and again, the only main, the main thing here is that that this has to balance to this over here. The uh, specific amounts aren't so important. Well, let's say we spend $6 to buy an asset that's worth $10. Now, I know that if you've had accounting class, you know that if you spend $6 uh, on, say, a, a piece of equipment, you record that purchase at $6. But here, we're not talking about accounting balance sheets. We're talking about market value. At least that's my illustration here. So in market value terms, if I spend $6 to buy an asset worth $10, then you can see how this is represented over here. And in fact, we see that assets have increased in value by $4. And the question is, how is that value that's been created, how is it going to be split up between the creditors and the equity holders? Well, if you remember the example we've all already looked at, we know that this value that's created is really attributable to the equity holders. See, the creditors have settled for a fixed return, uh, a finite term in a first claim on income and assets. That's what characterizes the creditors' claims. So if the company does exceptionally well, these guys have settled, they're gonna get the return that they had agreed to, uh, nothing more than that. And the equity holders, in this case, are gonna get that value that's created by this particular investment. And so that would be our ending balance sheet in this case. Value created through the assets is reflected first and foremost in the increased value of the equity. Now, by the way, we could go back and reverse this and say, what if the company makes a, makes a bad investment? And here, a bad investment would be one, for instance, where we spend $6 to buy an asset that's worth, well, less than $6, say $5 or $2. Uh, no company, we would think, does that intentionally, although in class I can tell you about uh, a company that I audited years ago that uh, year after year would lose money on one of its divisions and knew it was doing it and continued to do it intentionally. Well, at least they continued uh, maintaining this losing business uh, for other reasons. But we assume those companies don't do that. The goal is to maximize shareholder wealth, and you don't do that by investing in assets that are worth less than they cost. You do that by identifying, acquiring, 
and efficiently managing assets that are worth more than they cost. But imagine we could have here a situation where the, uh, an investment would, would be bad and in fact would reduce equity. And once again, we would see that the creditors are insulated from that because of their first claim on income and assets, uh, their the fixed return, and the finite term of their investment. Well, what about other goals like maximization of sales or market share? You know, we've talked about this, or I've talked about this goal as maximization of shareholder wealth, as if the uh, owners of the company are the only ones that we are concerned about. Uh, that is not the case. And in fact, you can't uh, you, you can't be uh, concerned only about the owners of the company uh, with regard to uh, maximizing even shareholder wealth. What about maximization of sales or market share, maximization of profits, let's say uh, pursuing a goal of, uh, of customer satisfaction uh, or employee satisfaction? Well, first of all, let's note that if we're talking about a maximization of sales or market share, that sales is an inadequate measure to begin with because you know we have to cover expenses. Anytime you generate a, a dollar of sales, that's going to cost you something uh, for the product or the service that you are that you're selling. So a company may have very healthy revenues and yet be losing money because it's simply not covering its costs. The same can be said for market share. Share sales and market share are useful uh, as goals as long as they're as long as you're making adequate profits. They're not in. They are inadequate as overall or ultimate goals. What about a goal to maximize profits? Well, if we're talking about accounting profits, you've had accounting, you should recognize that accounting profits can be managed or manipulated to some degree. They can result in a very uh, a low quality of earnings. They say that uh, figures can't figures don't lie, but liars can uh, or can't lie, but liars can figure. Uh, consider how uh, we use the use estimates in accounting, how we rely rely on them at times for. Uh, uh, determining, you know, the expenses associated with an, an asset. For instance, the uh, depreciable assets, long-term assets. We have to estimate a useful life. We have to estimate a salvage value, that is what the asset's worth at the end of its useful life. We estimate some, uh, uh, well, actually, we have to actually have to choose a, uh, um, a depreciation method, straight line uh, depreciation, for instance, or uh, one of several varieties of accelerated methods. So there's some opportunities there, let's say, for uh, choosing methods and making estimates that will help to shape the profit uh, picture that we show in a particular period. Also, allowances that we use for estimating uncollectible accounts receivable or the amounts of estimated uh, cost of product warranties or sales returns. All of these speak to the possibility that by because of estimates that profits in fact can be manipulated to some degree. But also, you know, there's just a real uh, reality that profits represent what we call a one period phenomenon. Uh, the firm may take a course of action that makes a particular period's profits look good but which will actually hurt the firm in the long run. For instance, you may have decided that your machines need to be ma need to be maintained. Uh, you know, uh, let's say broken down and parts replaced every three months, but that's expensive, so you decide to to delay that and do it every six months. Well, eventually you can, although it may make a particular year look good, you can imagine that's going to catch up to you at some point and uh, early replacement uh, of fixed assets. Well, the same thing might be said of say advertising and promotion if you cut back on the amount of, of advertising that you're doing, that may save you in the short run, but if in fact your name is not out there and you don't maintain that, uh, that recognition in the marketplace, it certainly could hurt you in the longer term. So we need to be aware, now research and development is another good example, if you don't spend that uh, money that you need to, you may find yourself falling behind and getting uncompetitive. And so you have to think in terms of uh, what the long term effects might be of uh, let's say some shortcuts taken in the in the short term. So the bottom line here and this is that we can't really trust profits. 
uh, because they represent a one period phenomenon and in fact are subject to being manipulated. Okay, let's go to the next video.